Well, everyone has heard the parable of the elephant and the blind man, right? Well, just in case you haven't, several blind men come and encounter an elephant, touching it with their hands. And one touches the trunk and thinks, oh, this is like a snake. Another one touches the ear and thinks, oh, this is like a fan or banana leaf. Another one touches the legs and thinks, oh, this is like a tree, and so on. Here's a drawing of it. So, when it comes to this teaching, the dharmasar, or essence of dharma, this teaching is vast, like an elephant. It's huge. Huh? I'm not going to pull any punches here. You all know this probably already. So, when someone first contacts this teaching, they're not going to be aware of the whole thing. They're not going to be aware of the elephant as a whole. But they're going to come in contact with one part, like the leg or the trunk or the tusk or the ear. <laughs> and they get their initial impression from that contact. The problem with this is, this teaching is so vast, uh, I'm going to put up the good old chart. Here it is. Because it covers the functions of all seven chakras and all four states of consciousness and the range of all philosophies from Dvaita all the way to Ajatta. So then, how is someone <laughs> who is just coming in contact with this teaching, how, how can they understand its scope? Huh? It's really not possible. Because we have to give some teaching on every level, according to every chakra, and in the light of, or from the point of view of, every state of consciousness, every type of yoga, every philosophy, and so on. So how is someone going to understand when they first contact that this is really just a tiny part of an immense whole? Well, they can't unless we give them something to understand it. Over the last few weeks, I've been in a conversation with one of our viewers who is a professional transcriptionist. And he very kindly volunteered to transcribe some of our videos. And they're coming out really very well. We had some other people volunteer to transcribe, but their transcriptions were so full of errors, I had to spend hours going through and editing them. And it was just, it wasn't worth my time, you know. But this man, he really knows his stuff, and he produces excellent work. He also cares about how people see this channel when they encounter it. And so we've been having this, this conversation, not using this particular metaphor of the blind man and the elephant, but in similar terms. How can we ensure or how can we facilitate people who are just coming for the first time to see the scope, the vastness, and the completeness of this whole teaching. Maybe they're coming from a Google search or a YouTube search on a particular topic. And so they wind up in the midst of some series. You know? And of course, the series are all created as a whole and meant to be viewed as a whole from beginning to end in sequence. And not only that, the series themselves are in a certain sequence from beginning to end, from the lowest to the highest state of consciousness. So then, how can we introduce someone to this teaching without them becoming overwhelmed with too much information? It's a big problem. 
So his suggestion, and I think this is very good, is to create an introductory series of maybe no more than a dozen videos and promote it very widely on the channel so that anyone who comes into a random video has access to a way to get up to speed on the entire vision before they get lost in chasing down different videos in different playlists and series and so on. I already tried to do this. <laughs> But you see, this is the problem with my point of view. Stuff that seems absolutely uh, beginner level to me is often way over the heads of people in general. It's been so long since I've been a people in general, <laughs> I forget what it's like to encounter absolute knowledge. I forget. I, I Really, it's been so long. I attained first path, which is basically the darshan of Brahman, in 1984. I barely remember what that was like, and I've come so, so far since then. So this fellow is doing a real service by giving me his beginner level point of view. And actually, he's not such a beginner, but compared to me, <laughs> He still remembers what it's like to be clueless, whereas I don't. <laughs> anyway, he's giving me his point of view to help structure a series of videos. And maybe I have to make a couple more videos, you know, to fit in that series somewhere. I don't mind. But the idea is so good because this way we'll avoid the elephant and the blind man syndrome where someone contacts, let's say, um, Lalita Sahasranam. And then he thinks, oh, this is just about Sri Vidya. No, <laughs> it's about much more than that. Sri Vidya is one level in the process, one layer of the cake. Huh? But of course, as you know, I hope, <laughs> it's not at all the whole even though it is kind of the central point, the heart of the series. So what I'm asking is for feedback. I don't get enough feedback. I mean, it's very nice when people say, oh, this is great, this is wonderful, I love it. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. It makes my day and it keeps me motivated. But what we really need in this situation is feedback about what you would need to see in an introductory series or what you think should be in that series to kind of describe the whole spectrum of the teaching, which is quite vast and quite complicated. The other topic I wanted to go into in this video is related to how do you recognize a realized being or how do you select a guru or how do you approach a guru? Because that topic is coming up in our series on the Mahatmya Kanda of Sri Tripura Rahasya. And one answer that I came up with is how do you measure a guru? Well, there's a couple different ways. One is in terms of the Shastra, the scriptures. But because in the beginning, most people don't know the scriptures, <laughs> how are they going to measure? The only thing they have to measure by is themselves. How do I see the guru compared with me? So a good way to see how uh, advanced a guru or teacher is, is what can they do that I can't? And I remember very early in my life when I first came in contact with my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, there was about 50 things that he could do <laughs> really, really well that I couldn't even begin to do. I was so impressed. He was a great musician, a great singer, uh, a great instrumentalist. He was full of devotion. 
and it came out in ecstatic waves that everyone could see and feel. He was expert in writing. He could write very, very well and explain clearly and simply topics that were so far advanced compared to Western philosophy and religion that they, they don't even match, you know. And he could organize, he could inspire, he could lead people. He could establish businesses and trusts and temples and religious organizations. He could travel everywhere. Huh? He, even though he was very old, by the time I met him, he was like 75 and his health was already failing. He was fearless. He would go anywhere and do anything that he thought would push on his mission. And that's another thing. He was so dedicated to his mission. He was so uh, inspired by his Guru Maharaj that he was willing to sacrifice his life even for the cause of his particular beliefs. So the list goes on and on and you get the idea. Compared to him, he was like the sun and I was like a firefly, a glow worm, <laughs> a little spark <laughs> compared to the great sun. So of course, when I met such a person like that, I immediately felt, oh, this is my guru. I had no doubts. Well, actually I did have doubts. In the beginning, I was wondering if it was all a scam. But that was only because I met some of the temple leaders and people like that who were not self-realized and who were cheating in different ways. And of course, I immediately picked that up and said, well, what about the leader? You know, is he like that too? But then when I went to India and started to spend time close to him, I realized, no, he's the real thing. And uh, no, no doubts anymore about him. So how we measure a guru is in terms of what he can do or what he knows that we don't. And really in that sense, everybody is in our guru because everybody knows something that we don't. Huh? Our knowledge is very limited, very specialized, very narrow to our own life. And everybody knows something that we don't. So in that sense, everybody is our teacher. Everybody is our guru. And then there's the guru as master of a particular subject. For example, my music guru, Ali Akbar Khan. In so many ways, he was imperfect. But as far as music, uh, there was no, no equal. Uh, so in that sense, he was my guru because he was a master of a particular subject that I very much wanted to know. But then you have the Sadguru. And the Sadguru is not somebody on a pedestal off in some holy land or heavenly realm or something. No, the Sadguru is a hands-on person. He's a doer, huh? but he also has the being of Brahman. He's a pure being using the remaining time in this body to help others. Uh, this is known as Jivan Mukta. He's a Jiva, he's born, he's in a body, huh? yet he's also Mukta, he's liberated. So this is what happens when someone attains liberation in the middle of a lifetime. Then the prarabdha karma or the ripened karma for the rest of that life has to play out according to destiny, according to fate. And usually the realized souls will use that time to teach and help others. Uh, that is if they have any ego left at all. <laughs> Some don't. There's such a thing as enlightenment without remainder, where there is no ego left and the being may stay in the body, you know, a short time after that, but they usually then disappear.
but someone who has the desire to help others, they're called enlightened with remainder. And they make the ideal teachers because they remember, at least to some degree, what it was like not to be enlightened. And so they understand life and they can help others to attain the highest enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.